Good morning, ACES. We're gonna start in about four minutes. Patrick is just kind of running through his PowerPoint and he's got everyone muted. Um, so uh, he'll come on and talk a little bit about kind of what's gonna happen. And then after he's done presenting, we'll have a meeting, and we'll unmute folks so we can all check in. Yeah, we'll just give it a few more minutes so people keep logging in. Good. All right, Erica, do you want to get started? Yeah, it looks like it's about 9.31 on my computer and we have 32 folks here. So good morning, Aces. I'm so glad to see you <laughs> on a nice Monday morning uh, with lots of drizzle out there. Um, as you know, we're gonna be listening to a presentation from Patrick Schultz on forests. Um, he is an extension forester with WSU and he covers an area um, on the west side of the state, a rather large area. I think he'll tell us a little bit more about that. 
He's going to present for about an hour and a half or so. And then following that, we'd like to have a short meeting um, so we can check in about how folks are doing with Answer Clinic, do a little bit of troubleshooting and a little bit of training. So um, that portion will probably be just around 20 minutes or so. So I think um, Patrick is also going to kind of give us a little bit of an orientation to using this platform. So um, thanks everybody for being here and thank you so much, Patrick. We're really looking forward to this. Awesome. Yeah, thank you, Erica. Um, yeah, super excited to give this talk. I have had to cancel several <laughs> educational events, as many of you would imagine, and uh, having a little bit of human interaction, human interaction today is kind of nice while we're all holed up in our houses. Um, so I was really looking forward to this, uh, giving this talk here. Uh, before we do get started, um, I did want to make sure everyone um, first can hear me okay. Um, so if you haven't already, there is a chat box function on the Zoom. Uh, and if you want to keep that open during the webinar, um, that's the, really the best way to, to handle all of this. The reason that you guys are all muted uh, is that the way Zoom handles these meetings is that whenever someone's audio comes on, they will, it'll trigger the screen. And so you could potentially steal the screen anytime your dog barks or something like that. So that's why everybody's muted. And if you have questions, please just enter them into the chat box. Uh, it looks like Margaret says you can hear me just fine. Um, as long as it, no one else um, is typing in that they can't hear me, I'll assume that we're all functional and good to go. Um, but if you do have any problems, just type it into the chat box there and um, we can get that figured out as we go. So I'll have that uh, box open here in the corner of my screen so I'll be able to see whatever you guys are doing. So uh, as Eric said, I'm an extension forester for Washington State University. I cover all of Southwest Washington. My job is to do a lot of programming similar to what Erica does, um, but reaching out to small forest landowners in the region, helping them manage their properties, um, you know, for all kinds of different reasons. Some people are harvesting timber, some people want to create wildlife space, um, some people want an area to recreate and camp. Um, and so I kind of give them the tools uh, to do all of these things and help develop forest stewardship plans. Um, so and in doing so, I kind of have a finger on the pulse of the area and you know what forest health problems people are facing. Um, so I developed this talk, uh, this presentation that I, I gave quite a few times last fall um, and at several Master Gardener trainings of, is your forest healthy? or what does a, for, a healthy forest really look like? And it's a more complicated question than you would imagine. Um, maybe some folks would guess that it's complicated, but um, a lot of people are surprised to find out that there's a lot of nuance to whether or not a forest is healthy. Now, so as master gardeners, some of this stuff may not apply to you um, necessarily, but I do think it is all good information, especially you know, when you're answering questions from people coming in to the Master Gardener Clinic, or um, I'm not sure how you guys are operating that right now, but um, you know, it is really important to understand the context. And a sick tree in a forest can be a lot different than a sick tree in your front yard. Um, so we're going to be talking about a forest setting and what it means to have a healthy forest. Um, like I said, if you have any questions at all, just type it into the chat box. Um, and I'll try to answer those as we go. So let's see here, make sure my screen's working. There we go. Um, so what I want you to leave with today is a basic understanding of tree mortality in a forest, um, you know, good versus, or normal versus bad. You know, when are we worried that a tree has died? Um, and the other part we would like to, to address is uh, just a few common misconceptions about certain forest health issues, particularly things like bugs, uh, bark beetles in particular, are something that people have a lot of fear around. Um, some of it a little bit unwarranted, and we'll talk about that. Um, fungus, fire, there's all kinds of things out there that want to kill your trees, and we're going to talk about what's real and what isn't, where the actual concerns should be. 
Um, and I probably won't do this last bit, that, that last bit for, um, you know, resources available to small forest landowners. That's kind of an extra 20 minute talk or so that I give to small forest landowners. I'm just borrowing this presentation. That probably won't be as relevant to you. Um, but if you do want that information, you can always email me and I can get you that. <clears throat> Sorry. All right. So before we start talking about the health of a forest, we need to understand the basic parts and functions of the components of a forest, which are individual trees, right? Um, a forest really isn't much more than an aggregation of trees and the relationships that get created when those trees aggregate. So this will be, I'm sure, a review for a lot of you. Um, this is stuff we learn in high school to some degree, but it's always good to get a refresher. Um, <clears throat> so starting on the right side here, we've got this little graphic uh, that one of my counterparts, Kevin Zobrist, um, created to show the different layers of a tree. If, uh, if you don't know, a tree has layers, kind of like an onion, I guess you could say. Um, and each one plays a different role. So starting from the outside, we have the bark, uh, which is, you know, everybody knows bark, right? Um, it serves largely a protective purpose. It's protecting the tree, the inner parts from the outside world, just kind of like our skin does. Um, different trees have different bark and different bark strategies, I guess you could say. Um, so for instance, Douglas fir, uh, one of the most common trees in Western Washington, it has a very thick bark. And the reason for that is it's evolved to tolerate certain amounts of fire. Uh, whereas something like Western Hemlock uh, or even Western Red Cedar have very thin bark uh, and are very sensitive in that, in that sense. So they do not have that fire protection function. Um, so different barks there, different bark strategies, uh, if you want to call it that, but all, all together still serving the same purpose. Inside of that bark, the next layer you have is the phloem. Um, some of you probably know that this is responsible for sugar transport. So basically all the sugar that gets created up in the canopy and the leaves are then transported down throughout the tree via the phloem. Inside of that layer is the cambium. And this is arguably the most important layer of the tree, uh, if there is such a thing. Um, it is the, the growth tissue responsible for annual diameter growth each year. So each year it is creating new phloem and new um, xylem or sapwood and it's, it's what's making the tree grow in diameter. Um, so this is really important to know especially when we get to insects damage because a lot of insects and animals quite frankly uh, and fungus really everything wants to eat this because this is where a lot of the sugars and stuff are along with the phloem and it's some of the tastiest stuff but when that cambium gets damaged um, you know at a, a severe enough scale that tree will die and um, that will be very important to know especially when we talk about bark beetle. Inside of the cambium is called the sapwood it's also xylem um, it is responsible for water transport so it is taking water and some nutrients from the roots up to the tree up into the leaves um, to you know do photosynthesis and so on. And then you have heartwood, which is basically retired sapwood. Um, it's no longer transporting water, but it is still serving a function of storage and also structural, uh, structural function. It's helping you know, keep the tree standing to some degree. We've all probably seen trees that have heart rot and that, that the fungus is attacking this heartwood at the center of the tree. And what a lot of what that does is reduce the structural integrity of that tree. That tree is a lot more likely to fall over in a windstorm because it does not have any heartwood. Um, but other than that, it really does not serve a function in regards to like water or nutrient transport. <clears throat> so cover, that's, that's the uh, layers of the tree, you know, looking at a cross section. Now we look at a standing tree and look at the different parts over here on the left. Uh, real quick, can, can people see my cursor? I don't know if you can or not. Um, if you can, just type yes into the chat box or no, because um, that would be helpful for me. Okay, good, good. 
So um, looking over here at the parts of a tree, again, this is definitely going to be a review. Um, but one of the most important pieces you need to think about is this very top part of the tree is called the terminal bud. It's also called the leader. So this is the part of the tree that's responsible for height growth each year. Um, and it's really important to know uh, because, again, a lot of things want to eat this too, especially when the tree's small and you have problems with things like deer and elk. And when you lose that terminal bud, it can really set the tree back. It's not going to kill it necessarily, but it is going to set the tree back pretty severely. Um, we'll talk about that when we get to animal damage a little bit later. So any part of the tree that has uh, living foliage is what we call the crown. Um, the bowl is the section of the trunk uh, of the tree between the roots and the crown. Um, the stem is anything above the ground. And then we have roots below the ground and you have the root collar, which maybe not everybody knows is a thing, but it, you would know it as soon as you see it, you look at a tree and it just ever so slightly starts to flare out at the very base before it goes underground. So this is sort of the, the meeting of the two parts of the trunk and the root of the root and it serves important functions. It still has all the qualities of a root, but it is kind of tougher like a trunk. Uh, that's why we kind of separate it from the rest. Um, and then you have all these finer roots, um, which are, are really important to protect, especially when you come to seedlings, because this is what all your surface area is uh, for contact with the soil and collecting moisture and nutrients and that kind of thing. I'm sure a lot of you know that already. <clears throat> Sorry, I um, have some allergies of all things right now, so I'm, I'm going to be coughing a little bit. I promise I'm not sick, not that it really matters <laughs> to you all via a webinar. Um, okay, let's see here. Moving on, um, we kind of covered this already a little bit, but, and this is definitely a, a oversimplification of how a tree functions. I'm sure a tree physiologist would be very upset with me right now, but we're not tree physiologists, so we don't need to know all the details. Basically what happens is uh, water takes water, or a tree takes water and nutrients up from its roots, delivers it to the canopy, to its leaves, where it conducts this, which I'm sure we all remember this equation from high school. Uh, this is photosynthesis. So you get six carbon dioxide, six waters, then you get sugar and six oxygens as a byproduct. Um, so those sugars that the tree creates then get redistributed back throughout the tree. Uh, it is important to know this again, um, just because there are things out there uh, that want to kill your tree and it interrupts some of these functions and it's important to know which one is interrupting. Okay, so that is the basic parts and functions of an individual tree. Um, but as I, I mentioned, you know, a forest is an aggregation of trees. And it's greater than the sum of its parts, right? It's not just a bunch of trees together. Uh, what happens when you have an aggregation of trees is it takes on its own qualities, its own ecology, which is what we call forest, a forest ecology. And they, they change over time. Um, so forest stand development describes structural changes in a forest over time, uh, given a large scale disturbance. And it's really important to know this part because, so it seemed to fade out in volume a little, okay. Um, I don't know that there's anything I can do about that because I have my headphones in and my mic is pretty close to my mouth. So um, hopefully that's just a technical glitch. I know Zooms um, right now across the country, some is a little bit bogged down because everybody's switching to webinar platforms. I don't know if that has anything to do with it, but if it becomes a, a real problem, uh, let me know and maybe I can log out and log back in and see what happens there. Um, all right, so back to forest stand development. It is really important to understand that forests change over time. Um, one of the reasons for that is that trees 
a lot of trees die in the course of stand development and it's totally normal and actually necessary for a lot of trees to die along this process and we'll, we'll talk about what that looks like but understanding that tree mortality is an essential function of stand development makes makes the question of what is a healthy forest much more complex so what we're going to do is just kind of walk through the phase the lifespan of a forest uh, Imagine, you know, a thousand acres totally burned to a crisp by a big fire, um, no trees left over, and it's just basically bare mineral soil. Um, after that huge disturbance, you know, a forest is inevitably going to get started there uh, again, um, but on its own terms, obviously, and it's going to take some time. Um, but this phase is what we call stand initiation, you know. It's pretty plain. It is the establishment of a new cohort. And the term cohort really, I like to think of it like a graduating class. You know, it's, um, it's a group of trees that all got started more or less at the same time. So like I said, it occurs after a major disturbance, um, something enough to clear enough area to really restart the clock. You know, it's more than just taking down a few trees, it's taking down a wide area. Um, enough so that you get pioneer species starting to reestablish in the area. And a pioneer species is a species of tree that requires um, certain conditions uh, to thrive. And two of them are uh, lots of light, which would only have to happen after a major disturbance, and lots of bare mineral soil to get started. Um, and so Douglas fir is a prime example of the most common uh, pioneer species in Western Washington. So it likes to get established in that bare mineral soil and it is very shade intolerant. So that means it cannot handle any shade and can only really get started in these conditions. So um, that's, that's kind of, that, that's really what it amounts to is just getting trees on the ground. It is more complicated than that. Um, nowadays, you know, after a major disturbance, the disturbance is most likely logging. And we're actually mandated by law to go back and plant um, within three years of that major disturbance of logging. So it's a little different than it would happen naturally. Um, so before all of that, in a natural situation, it would, trees would just kind of seed in uh, from adjacent areas or, you know, leftover seed in the seed bed in the ground. And it would probably take a long time, you know, five to 10 years for there to be, or more, uh, for trees to really get established in this area on its own. Um, now, like I said, we do it within three years, usually the year after. And one of the reasons we have to do that is because we have all kinds of invasive species now that will take over a new site and make it virtually impossible for trees our forest to get established naturally. Uh, but as far as stand development goes, this is just simply getting trees in the ground, getting a forest adequately stocked. What you'll find is that you have a lot of trees in this stage. And then as you get into later stages, much, much less trees. Uh, so obviously some death is occurring. And that really tends to happen in the second stage. This is what we call stemic seclusion, um, which sounds a little spooky, right? Some stems are about to be excluded. Um, rid of these, the forest itself is getting rid of these stems because it's just got more than it can handle. Um, there is a capacity, every, every site has a capacity in what kind of, or the, the number of trees that it can sustain at a given size and age of the tree. So this period of uh, stand development is characterized by high stand density, as you can see from these pictures here. Um, so these pictures are probably, or definitely planted you know, these are not naturally started for us, um, but they were never thinned. And so they have really started to stagnate. Um, we'll talk about what that means a little bit later on. But in this stage, you have really high stem density. Uh, you also have canopy closure. Um, so you can see it's very dark under there, very shady. Um, so we, we have a canopy over top of us. And you experience significant competition and as a result, mortality in this space. So there's a lot of competition going on behind um, in all of these trees. Some are, you know, 
better suited than others. Some got a head start, some are on a little bit better ground, and so they're gonna outgrow the other ones. And the, the you know, weaker are going to get thinned out over time. And so that's, again, in a natural setting, this could take decades. Um, you know, in a, in a managed setting, we actually go in there and we choose the trees that we want to keep and leave. A lot of times that's for timber, but, and again, we'll cover this a little bit later on, the forests in these pictures are extremely unhealthy. So thinning these, even just for forest health is important. This is why, uh, you know, our whole mantra at an extension forestry is active management is key no matter what your goals are. Um, so in a natural setting, this would thin itself out. A lot of times when we get into these plantations, it becomes very difficult for trees to thin themselves out. But regardless, once a uh, forest kind of moves past that thinning phase, that self-thinning phase, it reaches what we call maturity. Um, so there's a lot less mortality and competition going on at this point. There is some competition. There's always going to be some competition and a little bit of mortality. But you're not really losing like half your stems like you would in a stem spacing phase. So you have a relatively uninhibited growth happening in your first cohort, that first group of trees. And the other part here, and this is why it's also called understory reinitiation, this phase, uh, you start to see the establishment of a second cohort of shade tolerant species in the understory of the first cohort. So this can be species like Western hemlock, um, Western red cedar, big leaf maple is pretty shade tolerant, um, Grand fir is a little shade tolerant. So you're starting to see some of these other species move in. And their strategy is to simply survive and wait for a canopy gap to open and allow them to move up. Um, so they're shade tolerant. That just means they can tolerate it. That doesn't mean they like it. Uh, every tree wants all the light and water and sun it can get, but it can tolerate these, um, these conditions. And if you give it enough time, and around here, it's a really long time, uh, you get to what's called old growth. And I'm sure we've all heard this term before. It's a little bit loaded. Um, and honestly, there's arguments, even among foresters, about when old growth actually begins. Um, and we could have a whole conversation just about that, a whole class just about that. But some key characteristics here is that pioneer cohort, that first group of trees um, starts to die off. So around here, again, that'd be Douglas fir. Um, and the thing about that is, as many of you know, Doug fir can live easily 600 years, uh, oftentimes up to 1,200 years old. If anyone has ever been to the Grove of the Patriarchs up near Mount Rainier, um, that is the best possible example I can think of as a true old growth forest. You have 1,200 plus year old Doug firs, um, many of which are dying off. And then you have this um, sort of cascade of different age classes existing of all different species, which is another characteristic of old growth. You know, remember in the understory reinitiation phase, previous one, um, we have two cohorts. We've got a young one and an old one. Now, as trees continue to move in and move in and move in, we no longer really have identifiable cohorts. It's just the spectrum of age. And at the Grove of the Patriarchs, you could be walking and you'll be next to a 1200 year old Doug fir and a 600 year old Western Red Cedar. And then you walk a hundred yards and you'll be in this little patch of red alder that's 10 years old. Um, and that's, it's this kind of small gap disturbance that starts to occur. That's what we call gap dynamics. You're not getting these huge fire disturbances like we talked about that set this whole thing into motion. You're just getting little ones, you know, two or three trees dying here, opening up some light for other things to move in. Um, and that's kind of how the forest changes at this stage. And it can go on in perpetuity uh, until you get one of those major disturbances, like a, like a big forest fire. So with that in mind, you know, obviously stand development, a lot of trees uh, died to get from you know, here in the stand initiation phase uh, to old growth. Um, 
I mean, a lot of trees, more than half died to get to that phase. So when do we say, you know, a forest is unhealthy? That's the question we're gonna kind of try to answer throughout the rest of this presentation. Um, one thing to remember, forest health is different than tree health. And, and when we're talking about the scale of a forest, an individual tree is not necessarily an indicator of the health of the entire forest. Um, dying trees are really important. They move along for succession. So succession, I haven't mentioned yet, is a little bit different than stand development. Development describes uh, structural changes in a forest. Succession describes species changes. And so that just means that over time, forests tend to move towards shade tolerant species that have kind of established in the understory. And so dying trees moves along for a succession. It introduces diversity, um, both structural and specific or species. So it's, it's really important to have dead trees. Um, they serve a very important function. So dead wood, um, for instance, this picture here, if anyone can recognize what that is, it's, uh, it's called a nurse log. And so Western hemlock, which is what's growing all over that log, um, really thrives in that situation and actually has a hard time establishing if there is not a nurse log available. So here, uh, that tree died, uh, but it was really important and added a lot of biodiversity to the forest. It's adding, you know, carbon to the soil and nutrients. It's, you know, it's, it's really serving a lot of functions all on its own. So uh, you really wouldn't want to have a forest without some dead trees. The other part is that I think I want to say about 40 to 50 percent of vertebrate, all vertebrate wildlife requires some sort of dead wood um, in its life cycle. So it's very important to wildlife as well. So if dead trees are important to forests, when do we worry? Um, one, when your management goals are affected, every landowner has different management goals. Uh, like I said, some it's timber, some it's wildlife, some it's recreation, some it's a mix of everything. Um, so if something out there is happening and it's affecting your management goals, um, that's when we might say some action is needed. So a good example of this would be root rot, which is a totally native fungus, um, normal part of the ecology. We'll talk about it in more detail. Um, but if you are someone that is incredibly timber oriented, right, you're running your forest like a business and you've got something like root rot that's, you know, ruining your inventory then you're gonna consider it a forest health issue. So it's a little bit relative in that sense. You also, as a, as a forester, I would say when ecosystem services are lost, you have a forest health problem. Um, and ecosystem services refers to basically all the things that forests provide for us. Um, so timber is obviously one of them, but there is lots of other functions like clean air, clean water, um, carbon sequestration, things like recreational value, educational value, uh, even spiritual value. When trees start to lose some of these benefits or forests lose these benefits, then that's when we start to worry that there are some forest health issues at play. Um, when normal forest development is disrupted. So this picture on the right, I'm sure a lot of you recognize what's going on there. Uh, that is an English ivy dominated forest. Um, and something to think about here is that there are no tree is going to get established in that understory. So you basically have a um, forest de development being completely halted. So that is clearly a forest health issue. And then when there's a lack of resilience, um, and so resilience is something we'll kind of allude to over time, but a, a, I really think a, a healthy forest is a resilient forest, uh, one that can bounce back from challenges like drought, climate change, fire, invasive species. Um, it, that is ultimately the sign of a healthy forest. And resilience is, in a lot of ways is a function of diversity and um, having lots of, you know, a rich species diversity, structural diversity. And we'll cover that a little bit more too. So if there's no questions on that little foundation bit, what I'm gonna do is talk about um, some of the common here I call them culprits. I really don't think that's fair because all, almost all of these 
um, aside from some specific ones, are native uh, pests, pathogens, animals that are serving an ecological function in our forest. So culprit's not the right word. But um, common forest health issues um, in, in Western Washington, things that might be responsible for killing some. So before we get into that, uh, I wanted to describe this tool that foresters use. It's called the Forest Health Triangle. It's very similar to like the fire triangle. If anybody's heard of that, the three things that are necessary for a fire are heat, uh, fuel, and oxygen. If you take out one of those, you don't have a fire anymore. Uh, so the same thing goes with this forest health triangle. Um, in order to have a disease, um, so in, in, in forest health terminology, a disease is anything affecting a tree. So uh, it's not just like a fungus or anything. A disease could be a bug, a disease could be uh, abiotic, it could be like a drought, it could be hail. Hail can be considered a disease. I know it's pretty weird, but that's the way that we coin things. Um, so in order to have a disease, you have to have these three legs of the triangle, environment, agent, and host. And for an example, um, we, uh, I use the Swiss needle cast disease. So this is a fungus, a foliar fungus, that attacks Douglas fir. And in terms of environment, it requires uh, a lot of moisture. So it really, it really it tends to only happen within 25 miles or so of the coast where they get all that, that fog belt. So there's a lot of moisture there. So that's the environment. The agent is the actual fungus, the spores, and the host is Douglas fir. When you get all three of these things together, you get the Swiss needle cast disease. Um, and so managing it becomes a function of, all right, well, what, what leg can I alter here of the triangle? If you look at this, you know, you're not going to change the climate, uh, at least not on your own. You're not going to be changing the uh, agents. You know, the spores are everywhere and probably in the room where you are right now. <laughs> you know, they're spores. They're, they're literally everywhere. Um, so your only option then is to change the host. And that's actually something that a lot of industrial timber companies are doing out towards the coast. They're growing less Douglas fir and growing more um, like Western hemlock, cedar, other things that are not affected by this. And also keep in mind the Swiss needle cast fungus actually is totally native. It is not from Switzerland. It was discovered in Switzerland when um, some Swiss folks took Doug fur back to Switzerland and then they discovered the fungus. So, you know, I'm not really sure how that worked out, but it is in totally native species. And that's why, generally speaking, you don't see as much Doug fur as you get closer to the coast. Um, not as much as you would in the, in the interior and the foothills and the Cascades. But this forest health triangle is kind of how we approach certain forest health issues and how, how to manage them. Uh, in the context of actually one thing to manage them. <clears throat> so first, first, first things first is root rots. I, I always talk about root rots first because they are by far the most common biotic tree killer um, in Western Washington. And so biotic versus abiotic, if you don't know what that means, um, you know, it's living versus non-living. Biotic is a living pest. Abiotic would be a non-living pest, like drought or something. So this is, but root rot by far is the most common living tree killer. It is a fungus that destroys the roots of primarily conifers. Um, certain species can attack hardwoods, though, um, of trees, and it it will definitely kill your tree. It is in some cases very aggressive, in other cases not so much. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit. There are three common species. Laminated um, is by far the most common species. Uh, it's Valinus is the genus of that one. And that tends to attack Doug firs and your true firs like Noble and Grant, um, a little bit more than others. Our malaria, is also very common. 
that has a much wider host range. That one will actually attack hardwoods in certain situations. Um, but it tends to be less weak, or, or sorry, less aggressive, a little weaker. Um, so you don't see, you know, vast damage, which would be scary because it has such a wide host range, you'd, you'd be worried about it. Um, but it actually is a little bit weaker usually. And then a gnosis, which tends to attack your hemlocks and some of your true furs. Um, so not that important to know all of these details. I don't expect anyone to really remember them. There's tons of resources out there to talk about the different details of all three of these. And there's a lot more than just these three. But these are by far the most common. When I'm out in the woods, these are the three that I have in mind. So yes, it will kill your trees. Is it a forest health problem? That is up to you. This is a perfect example of you know, your, the subjectivity of this issue. Um, root rot serves a very important ecological purpose. It is exactly the thing that opens up those gaps and allows new species to move in. It creates hardwood patches that are great for wildlife. Um, it'll bring in shade tolerant species to give them a chance to establish in the canopy. So it brings a lot of diversity to the forest in the long term, um, which can be very, very good. So the bad part of it is you lose trees. And if you are somebody that, um, I mean, there's a couple situations. One would be like if you're, um, you know, somebody that's trying to grow timber and you're losing trees, that's not really good, right? That's uh, financially, that's adverse to your objectives. But the other situation I've been in quite quite frequently is that some people may have, you know, only two or three acres of forest. And some of these root rot patches can be huge, you know, they can easily be three acres. Um, but it takes a long time for them to get that big, uh, keep in mind. But so they don't want to lose all their trees. And so they're kind of forced to manage it. And so that's another situation where this becomes an issue where you would actually take some action. But again, it's going to be circumstantial, totally up to you uh, and up to whatever landowner you're working with, whether or not they want to manage this. But first things first, we got to learn how to identify root rot. Um, and there's a whole suite of symptoms here. And you really have to look at all of them together more than just one. So the first thing that you might notice is reduced terminal growth. So if you look on the right here, this picture, you can see, well, one, you can see the tree just looks kind of sick, but ignore that for now. Just look at this growth. You can see that the tip of this tree is really rounded. It's kind of like a blunt spear. Um, if that tree was healthy, you know, that tr uh, it would be putting on two to three feet of growth each year, uh, depending on the site, and it would have a very sharp spear-like appearance. So when you start to see these little blunt trees around here, um, you, that can be an early indicator of reduced growth and possibly root rot. Uh, so that's one of the first signs that you see. The next that you would see is this yellowing sparse foliage. Um, I mean, anybody looking the, at this tree would know that there's something wrong with it. It's not doing too hot. And the next part would be a stress cone crop. Um, so this tricks people up a little bit. Um, so I like to call this kind of a going out of business sale. Uh, the tree knows it's dying and its only function in life really is just to extend its progeny, you know, get its genetics out there and repopulate. So this is a last ditch effort to do that. Um, the problem is it's sick. So it creates these small little malnourished cones that aren't very effective. And that's the distinguish, distinguishing factor between a, a stress cone crop and just a heavy mass year because some, you know, all trees will have heavy mass years. They'll have years where they'll just put out more cones than others. It's a reproduction tactic. If you put out a lot of cones all at once, it's less likely to be all, that all of them will get like eaten by wildlife and that kind of thing. So just because you have a lot of cones on your tree does not mean you have root rot. Again, you have to take into account all of these different symptoms. Um, but if those cones look pretty malnourished, you know, just kind of small and wimpy, and then the tree's also kind of yellow and sparse foliage, that's when you start to think, okay, this could be a root rot. In the later stages, when you have uh, trees actually dying, you start to get this jackstraw appearance. 
basically these trees are falling in every which direction. Um, and so it's important to know this because you know it wasn't like a microburst or a windstorm, because uh, then they would all be facing the same direction, right? So instead, what's happening here is that the fungus has eaten all of the roots, basically. Um, and so these trees are just standing there like sticks in the ground, and they just need just a little bit breeze, the, the smallest breeze just to fall over, or nothing at all. And then you get these um, root balls, or, or lack of root ball, really, that you see on the bottom end. You have no fine roots there whatsoever. That is a very clear indicator of root rot. And so this picture I took in an old Christmas tree plantation, this is a very, very classic example of laminated root rot. It creates these just almost perfect circular um, gaps. And uh, unlike some of the other root rots that just have a little bit messier uh, appearance, I guess, and not as neat uh, and circular, so this was just a near perfect uh, root rot gap. Um, I, I was able to chop into one of those trees and actually look at the fungus uh, to identify it, but I really didn't need to just by looking at it. I could see that this is probably laminated root rot. So um, the other part here is that because root rot, it moves very slowly. It advances very slowly through trees. It'll get established in one, and that's kind of the epicenter. And then it spreads outward from root to root contact to other trees. So you'll see this gradient of symptoms across the trees. And this picture right here is a perfect example. You have a dead tree, you have a sick tree, and then you have a seemingly healthy tree that probably has it. It just doesn't really know it yet. Um, because again, that root rot moves slowly. This whole process could take 10 years right here or more. Um, that's another reason that people aren't usually very alarmed or shouldn't be very worried about root rot. The symptoms move very slowly. Um, but they do tend to spread outwards and they will continue to spread until they hit, you know, some sort of barrier, either a lack of roots to spread to, um, or like, you know, for instance, if you have a laminated root rot issue, laminated root rot does not affect hardwoods. If it runs up against a little patch of hardwoods, that's gonna be the end of that root rot. Um, so it, it will continue to spread, it just takes a really long time. Identifying the species, the exact species is important if you're going to manage, we'll talk about that on the next slide. Um, it can be a little difficult. Um, there are resources available, I'll talk, I think I'll talk about those at the end there, um, in terms of like books that can help you identify this. Um, but it can, get a little difficult. That's why I generally for landowners recommend getting a forester out there uh, to, to identify the exact species. But again, that only really becomes important if you're going to be taking management action. So in terms of management, again, do you manage it or not? That's totally up to you. But the key here is stopping the spread with tree removal. So you're creating that barrier. You're removing the host. If you think about the, the forest health triangle, Again, here, you're, you're removing the host. You can't do anything about the fungus and you can't do anything about the environment in this situation. You're really trying to remove the host. So what that boils down to is getting rid of all sick um, trees and then also including a buffer. And we generally do two tree widths. Um, so a buffer of two trees in order to really slow that growth and make sure that the root rot is not going to spread outside of this you know managed area and i really say you know if you're going to actually manage for root rot go big or go home because um, you do not want to have to do this again usually this costs money people do not make money on this if by selling the timber um, and so it it really is much better as much as it might hurt to take two or even three seemingly healthy trees, take them and be safe, not sorry. Um, so, but that's the kind of idea here. And this little graphic shows you an H is a healthy tree, a sick, uh, S is a sick tree and a D is a dead tree. So you're taking a healthy buffer on either side to really isolate that root rot. And the next step is to plant 
trees back in if that's what you want to do. Um, you could allow it to turn into kind of a brush patch for wildlife. If that's up to you. But this is where knowing the species of river becomes very important because you have to know what's susceptible and what's not susceptible. So if you have, this graphic here is for laminated root rot. And if you have laminated and you just cut out a bunch of sick stuff, you are not going to be planting duck fir or global fir or grand fir back in there. It would, um, it would be a waste of time. It, root rot is considered a disease of the site. So one of the questions I get all the time is how long do I have to wait for the fungus to go away? Um, beyond your lifetime in most situations. It will go dormant once you remove its host and then it will probably come back the minute you plant something there you know 50 60 years later so it is not really um a possibility to just wait it out that's not really how it works so you have to plant something that's less um susceptible so with laminated that might be a pine or cedar or hardwoods hardwoods are completely immune to laminated root rot um, not necessarily uh, our malaria though and cedar is practically immune. I don't think I've ever seen it in cedar. And then again, pines, uh, you know, they're pretty much immune, but they are more likely to get them than cedar for sure. So again, that's where knowing the exact species is important. Otherwise, you know, it, it can be fun. I, I personally like to ID things just because I like to ID, ID things. I'm sure to some extent, some of us are all nature nerds that just want to do that. Um, but it certainly is not necessary if you're going to take a hands-off approach, which is a totally acceptable approach if you're not really worried about the ramifications of that root rot. All right, so moving on from that root rot, I just wanted to touch on this briefly before we go to the next bit, which I think is bark beetles. Um, so I get pictures of these sent to me all the time, um, and people are really worried that it's uh you know going to be an issue so these are heart and butt rots again these are funguses and instead of attacking the roots they tend to attack that inner heartwood which i mentioned earlier um really not a concern for any sort of widespread issue they don't spread very easily um they do obviously emit spores that can spread but generally speaking, they only get into a tree if the tree is wounded. Um, you know, so you can avoid the spread of these by pruning during the right time of the year, which is when trees are dormant. So December to about February, into March a little bit. Um, and also just avoiding wounding your trees whenever you can. But generally speaking, this is only gonna attack one or two trees in your forest and uh, you know per acre maybe at the most and they make for great wildlife trees so they hollow out the inside of these trees and then uh you know they do the job for like a, a woodpecker or another bird to go in there and nest so these again are serving kind of an ecological function really good for wildlife and not not a risk really as spreading um, unless you're going around and dinging up all your trees while these things are spreading spores which I wouldn't recommend under any situation. So, so gen, definitely don't be worried if you see any of these out there. Okay, so moving on to bark beetles. Um, this is a really important topic. I think, um, I think most people with, that own forests or even, you know, not even, don't even have to own forests, just kind of seeing trees dying um, the way we have in Western Washington have been very afraid that the reason is bark beetles. And I think the reason for that is that, you know, we see it on the news pretty often, um, you know, CNN, whatever, uh, massive bark beetle outbreaks, destroying whole stands. That will not happen in Western Washington, at least not anytime soon, um, you know, depending on the whole climate change and how fast that moves. I, I can't predict the future there, but I do not really think that will happen uh, here. So what you're seeing when you see massive bark beetle outbreaks is an inner mountain forests. We're talking about uh, Colorado, Montana, Utah, 
uh, even Eastern Washington a little bit, you get these huge outbreaks. And they are, generally speaking, climate change driven. Um, milder winters are not as effective as killing, at killing off some of the uh, like pine beetle uh, larvae. And so you get these really big outbreaks, big populations. So that's what it looks like in the inner mountain forests. Here in Western Washington, this is what a beetle outbreak looks like, like a bad one. So you've got maybe 20, 25 dead trees here, um, kind of scattered. Obviously, no one wants to lose trees, but this is really not, this is really not on the same scale at all. And so I try to just temper people's fears, first and foremost, with bark beetles. The reason for this is that in Western Washington, they are considered secondary pests. So bark beetles really only effectively kill trees that are already weak and stressed by something else. That could be root rot, it could be drought, it could be you know, wind damage, something else. And so it's getting rid of these trees and in a lot of ways serving an, another really important ecological function. If you think back to the stem exclusion phase of stand development, when you have all these trees, your forest is overcrowded, these beetles actually go in and speed that process along by getting rid of the weak trees and ultimately improving the gene pool of the, that tree species. So again, these are native pests. Um, here in Western Washington, we have some of the best tree growing ground in the world. And so healthy trees generally are able to uh, defend themselves. And we'll get into that a little bit. So there are different beetles, lots of different beetles, and they attack different species. Uh, I like to joke that there's a beetle for each species. And if you're lucky, you have two beetles for each species. Um, and they also attack different sizes of different trees. So it can get complex when it comes down to identifying. But I just want to start it off by saying that, you know, bark beetle outbreaks here in Western Washington are not the big deal that they are, you know, say in Colorado. So what they do, these beetles, um, I remember I mentioned that cambium layer that's so important. Uh, they girdle trees by feeding on that cambium and laying their eggs. Um, so this picture here shows what's called an egg gallery. So this is, uh, I believe, Doug Fir Beetle. No, this is actually Mountain Pine Beetle. Um, and so this, this main gallery right here is where the female laid its eggs. And so there's a nuptial chamber in here somewhere where the male and female made it. The female went on to chew a hole or a line in the cambium and laid its eggs. And then those larvae woke up or hatched and they fed off in different directions on the cambium and emerged from the tree as adults. And so what you can see, if you have enough of these placed around the circumference of the tree, that tree is going to get girdled and you're not going to be able to have sufficient, you know, phloem, uh, phloem flow, I guess, for lack of a better phrase. Um, and you're also going to have uh, um, a blockage of cambium growth there too. So that really will kill the tree. Uh, there's no way about it. Um, but again, generally speaking, this tree was probably stressed or weakened by something else first because trees can defend themselves. And they do that um, by, let's see if that's on the next stage here. Yeah, I'll get to that. Next one. Uh, but they have a couple tricks for defending themselves. Um, so generally speaking, though, these beetle outbreaks in Western Washington tend to occur after major wind events. Uh, that's when you actually see like a big outbreak. Um, and the reason for that is you have uh, all of this down fresh dead wood. It's basically just fresh food, fresh defenseless food is really important factor there because all those trees are dead now, but they're fr freshly dead. And so beetle populations will get in there, they'll build up and they get strong enough to go and take down other healthy trees. That's the only situation where they become maybe not so secondary. Um, but the, the key here is that, um, you know, this is what entomologists tell me at least, is that it basically takes two trees worth of food for beetle populations to build up to take down one healthy tree. 
So right there, you have a reduction of half in the population. Uh, um, you know, so it's, it's never going to become an exponential outbreak like it does in interior forests. But these major wind throw events, uh, that's when you get into active management. We'll talk about that. Uh, oops. So identification, it's pretty easy. Um, one of the first things you'll see is pitching. Uh, so that's what's happening here in the bottom left. So trees can flush out. Um, it's, it's not really quite sap, it's thicker than sap, um, through the entry holes that the beetle's trying to get in, and they flush the beetle out with it. And you can see the tree was successful here in defending itself. So when you see pitching, that doesn't necessarily mean that the tree's a goner. It actually means the tree's defending itself. Now, when you start to see exit and entry holes and boring dust like this, and no pitching, that's when you start to get concerned that the tree uh, is not defending itself and is succumbing to the beetle damage. And then ultimately, you will see this, which is um, trees with red foliage. I mean, they're dead. Uh, but the, the reason for this is that it's a very quick death. When the cambium gets girdled, the tree dies very quickly and the foliage just flushes completely red. So compare that to root rot, which we talked about takes a really long time. Uh, you know, this is a much, much quicker death. And so you can spot this from the road and a lot of people have. Um, and so you, you're pretty, you can be pretty sure that this was root rot damage when you see something die, or I'm sorry, beetle damage when you see it die this quickly. And the other part here too is this happens a lot and it's probably gonna start happening here uh, in the next month or so, although last summer was a little more mild, um, we have been seeing a, you know, an uptick in beetle damage just because of the drought stress in the last five or six years. And what happens sometimes is trees will die at the end of one summer and they'll go into dormancy and they won't flush red until around now, March, April, May, when they wake up and start to photosynthesize, but you know, they, they actually died. <laughs> you know, the previous year, and then they flush red. And so you see kind of a lot of them all at once, and it gets a little bit alarming. I usually get a lot of emails starting between April and June. I know last year I did because 2018 was such a hot, dry summer. Hopefully this year won't be so bad. So this was a tree in my neighborhood that it did exactly that. Um, all year, all winter, it was green. This is a noble fir. Um, within a week, it turned, uh, and so I, I went out and snapped a picture of that. So if you want to really get into it and really confirm not only that there are beetles, um, but also what kind, then you got to get under the bark and look at these egg galleries that I mentioned. Um, different beetles have different egg galleries, different uh, patterns. And so for instance, on the left here, this is the Douglas fir beetle. And what you get with the Doug fir beetle is these alternating larval galleries. So it'll lay them on the right and then on the left and the right and the left. And I think it's more of, it's like a utilization of space thing. Um, it's actually really interesting. You can see all of these lines, they run parallel, they never intersect. And the reason for that is that the larvae can actually hear the other larvae chewing. And so they avoid each other in that way. And these are all the little larval guys here. Um, so that's Doug fir beetle, probably the most common beetle. Another very common one is this one over here, which is the fir engraver beetle, and it has a lateral main egg gallery, so it's horizontal to you, um, whereas Doug fir, the main egg, egg gallery is up and down. So this one is, I think, becoming increasingly problematic because of drought stress. I have seen a lot of uh, true furs, your noble and your grand furs die because of this, and that's the primary species that the fur engraver attacks. Um, honestly, nine times out of ten, when I see a dead grand fur or noble fur now, I'm I'm pretty sure it's this, and it's pretty easy to identify again because of that lateral egg gallery. Um, I'm going to skip over this. This was meant for a different presentation, um, but these are Ips beetles. They behave very similarly, but they attack pines. And we have a very unique population of uh, six pine dips in Mason County, which I just think is funny. But ultimately, not really a concern. 
Um, one thing I want to say is that once a tree is dead, a lot of things move in. Um, and it can make it difficult for identifying those egg galleries. If a lot of things are moving in and feeding on the tree, it's no longer easy to figure out which one actually killed the tree. That's why when you're identifying these, it's really important to look at a freshly dead or dying infested tree. I also want to say that this is, you know, this is wood borer damage. If you see stuff that's going into the interior of the tree, this is nothing to be concerned about. <clears throat> this is uh, just uh, what we call saprophytic insects, insects that feed on dead material, doing their job, turning the tree ultimately into soil someday. Uh, so don't be concerned about those. The real stuff to be concerned about is the stuff that's eating these, that cambium layer. So in terms of management, um, ultimately here, an ounce of active management or prevention is worth a, you know, several pounds of cure here. So it's all about maintaining tree vigor. Remember, healthy trees here in Western Washington can defend themselves um, from beetles either by pitching or they can also isolate the damage of the beetle under their bark. Um, so it's, you know, they can survive beetles on their own if they're healthy. That's why managing things like stand density, uh, making sure your trees are healthy and vigorously growing is the first and most important step to avoiding any sort of beetle damage. The other step is to manage large inputs of fresh dead trees. So that is that defenseless food that we were talking about. Um, and removing green attacked trees, uh, trees that are, you know are not defending themselves and are going to die. So I, again, this is just managing the food source. Um, so the rule of thumb um, it, here is you don't want more than five, eight inch or greater in diameter trees dead per acre in a given year. So if you have more than five of those, eight inch or greater, that suddenly died in a year due to, you know, like wind, for instance, you want to get those out of there because that's about enough for beetles to build up populations and then go and attack some of your other trees. But again, taking a step back, realizing that even if you don't do that, most of the time here, beetles are not going to be causing any sort of major damage. People always want to turn to pesticides when it comes to beetles. It is not especially not in a forest setting. Usually it's not an option. Once a tree is infested, a lot of those uh, systemic insecticides that you inject into the tree just don't do a very good job of getting rid of infestations. They can prevent them. But also just think about the feasibility of treating multiple trees in a forest scale. Financially, it's just not feasible. There is a pheromone for Douglas fir beetle um, it's called HCH, I think. Um, so the beetles will emit two pheromones. One pheromone to say, uh, hey, you know, we're having a party in this tree, come on in and feed. And they have another one that says, there's no more room, you know, go find a different tree. So they isolated the pheromone that says, there's no more room in here. And they put it in these little bubble packets and you can just staple them to different trees. And it will actually just deter the beetles. Uh, and basically deflect them off to your neighbors, most likely. So you should probably tell them if you're doing this. But this is something you might do in the case of a major wind throw event that's adjacent to your property or something, you know, where you can't manage that and you just want to protect your trees. And this is relatively cheap. I think you can do it for like 30 bucks an acre or something like that. <clears throat> so like I said, there's lots of different species. Um, one for different, every species of tree probably. Um, Doug fir, for instance, has two. So the Doug fir beetle attacks trees that are eight inches and greater. The Doug fir pole beetle attacks trees smaller than that. Uh, so you're covered either way. But again, you know, generally not causing major concerns. I already talked about wood borers. Um, if you see these meandering galleries, pretty wide galleries like this. It can be kind of alarming to run into one of these larvae. They're a little gross looking, but generally speaking, these are not a problem. They only attack dead stuff and are, are decaying the, the wood into, uh, again, eventually soil. The cool little story here though, the modern chainsaw tooth was supposedly inspired by the wood borer um, that actually 
carves out the wood instead of sawing it, it rips it. And that was kind of what inspired the, uh, the modern chainsaw tooth, which I think is a pretty cool story. Okay, so moving on to defoliating insects uh, and diseases. So there is a whole suite of these, and I won't go into every single one in detail um, because I can kind of cover the basic function of them with some core uh, concepts here. Um, typically, they are not mature tree killers. They cannot cause you know annual growth loss um, by just damaging foliage but are not going to kill your tree in most situations. Um, so they are strongly influenced by local weather and um, you know, long-term cycles. So an example of that would be Swiss needle casts, um, particularly further away from the coast. If we have a really wet spring, then you might see some Swiss needle casts further in from the coast than usual. Um, the tent caterpillar here in the bottom left, I'm sure we all saw a lot of this last summer. So their populations also boom and bust cyclically. I'm told it's every seven years or so. I'm not sure how accurate that is. Um, but ultimately they just kind of boom and then their predators populations boom and you know, that's ecology. And, and they just kind of go through that cycle over every seven years or so. Um, so pesticides can be effective for some of these. Generally speaking, I don't recommend them because, you know, they're not, they're unsightly for sure, but it's not going to cause long-term damage most of the time. Uh, one exception to that, so this is the silver spotted tiger moth. Um, so it's a defoliating insect, just like the tent caterpillar. The difference is tent caterpillar attacks hardwoods. This one attacks conifers, particularly Douglas fir. Um, conifers are not very good at flushing back out after defoliating damage. So you may lose that branch. Um, whereas with the tent caterpillar, they'll defoliate it one year, the next year it'll come right back. It's no big deal. Um, so this could be, you know, your active management could be as simple as just cutting out that branch preemptively to and then burning it. Um, but you know, ultimately, I think you'd be fine doing nothing most of the time. I gotta caveat that a little bit. Uh, this thing up here in the in the top right, this is the alder flea beetle. So I don't know if anybody noticed this last year, but we had a uh, a boom in the alder flea beetle population. Almost every alder I saw was um, pretty much skeletonized. The leaves were chewed up, and again, it's not ideal. The tree doesn't like it but it's not going to uh, damage it long-term. Next year, it'll flush back, it'll be just fine. Oh, and I, did, I should say this about Swiss needle cast before we move on, is that it only attacks the previous year's foliage. So the new growth is totally fine uh, until the following year. So the, the trick here is, it, I mean, by definition, it's not gonna kill the tree. It's because it's not affecting the new growth, but it is gonna slow the tree's growth. And that's one of the reasons it's kind of an enemy of like the timber industry. And that's why they actively manage it. Um, Rhizoctonia boutonii, this is a, an exception to the defoliating fungus rule that it's not gonna kill your tree. It was discovered in Washington in 2016. It tends to only attack hemlocks. Um, so it's very rare though. I've seen no instances of it in Southwest Washington. There were some up north of Seattle. Um, but the foliage loss can result in mortality here. And it's a bottom up foliage loss. Um, and that's kind of unique. And a lot of foliage losses like top down and outside in. So I wouldn't be too worried about this though. It is not very common. There was some scares just a while back uh, and even some news articles about this, but I have not seen any anything resembling widespread damage. And then again, like I said, there is a lot of others, a lot of others, insects and diseases and things and bacteria that want to, you know, eat your trees and can cause damage to all or parts of it. Um, and I really couldn't cover even a quarter of them in an hour and a half. Um, but 
you know, there's lots of good books out there for IDing them. The message I want to get across is that for the most part, none of these are going to be the, you know, uh, a tree pandemic that will actually cause widespread damage usually. The ones that I covered so far are the ones that you kind of have to worry about the most. Um, but generally speaking, a lot of these are just gonna cause individual damage and have their own different management recommendations. Um, and again, I hope you consider me as a resource going forward if you can't ID something or are unsure of how to manage it. But it's really not feasible to be able to go through all of these. Um, and I'm going to push on here and I'm going to talk about animal damage and some invasive species and then a little bit of abiotic damage and we'll be done. So um, in terms of animal damage, let's see in the chat box, does anybody know what's going on in the, on the left picture there? Let's see if anybody replies. No guesses? Deer, beaver. Good guess that, especially deer, this could be easily mistaken for buck rub. Um, cougar, that's a, that's a good one too. Um, it's actually bear, black bear. So they like to feed on that cambium layer in the spring when there's not other food sources available and they've just woken up uh, from hibernation. So they will pick young trees with bark that's fairly thin that they can get through fairly easily. And you'll see these kind of teeth marks on it. They're, they'll claw up the cambium and then they'll chew the cambium off. And uh, it, black bear damage is widespread. It is uh, kind of a sleeper uh, forest health issue that people don't really think about a lot, and especially if you're in like Grace Harbor County. Um, it is very, very widespread and you can have a lot of damage. And they tend to seek out your, uh, your uh, health, healthiest, most vigorous trees too. So really kind of a thorn in most forest owner's sides um, and very difficult to manage. This over here on the right is not a very good picture, um, but did anybody wanna guess what's causing these uh, little holes all over the tree? Definitely a woodpecker, any particular kind? Yep, sapsuckers, someone said it, yeah. So sapsuckers are really unique. They have these lateral, I think I got a better picture. Yeah, so they cause these, just uh, these horizontal lines uh, rows. And so they'll feed on the sap from the tree. And what I'm told is that they'll actually come back and they will uh, feed on the insects that go inside of them. So generally speaking, they're really not gonna cause a lot of damage. I mean, if you look at this tree, it is more holes than tree, I think at this point, but it's still living and doing okay. Um, so obviously I think your tree would prefer not to get chewed up, but uh, really not gonna cause significant damage. Unlike bears, which will definitely destroy your trees. So there's a lot of other animals, deer and elk. Um, somebody mentioned deer, you know, they like to rub uh, trees uh, to get the velvet off of their antlers and they can do a lot of damage to trees in the process. They also love to browse on young trees, particularly Western red cedar, that is kind of their candy. And so if you're ever planting Western red cedar in Southwest Washington and you're not protecting those trees with cages or Bexar tubes, um, then you're really kind of throwing your money in the ground. So protecting your trees is really important for deer and elk issues, at least until you get over their browse line, which is about four and a half feet for deer and a little bit taller for elk. Porcupine, they like to chew up uh, on that cambium layer too. It's a little less common to have porcupine damage, but it does occur. Uh, mice and bulls, these are issues in pastures where people are trying to plant trees and you know reforest an area that, uh, or a forest is what it's called when you're planting into an area that doesn't have trees um, and so they like to hide in the grass and they'll just go right up to the base of your tree and, and girdle it by chewing on that cambium layer again so uh, you know a lot of animals out there 
want to chew in your trees, just like there's a lot of insects and fungus that want to chew in your trees. So really important to keep these in mind. I think these kind of go uh, unseen for the most part, or not unseen. I think, I think people forget about these, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And then there's drought uh, in terms of abiotic stressors. This is a big one. So especially now, I think in a sense, uh, 2015 and those five years, uh, those five summers, I think three of them have been pretty severe droughts. 2015 was really bad. 2017 wasn't great. 2018 was really bad for Southwest Washington. We had the worst drought conditions in the entire state uh, in 2018. And not everybody knows that because uh, it's, not, it's not normal really for Southwest Washington to be more drought ridden than the rest of the state. But it is causing severe damage on the trees, you know, um, and it's really more, so the, one of the reasons 2018 was so bad is about the timing. Um, so if anyone in the area remembers, in May, we got maybe 5% of the rain that we usually get. And that's the period in May when trees are really growing. And so that hit the trees really hard. And so we saw a lot of damage um, at the end of 2018 and into in last summer, um, just based on what had happened that previous summer. So drought tends to take... Uh, this the form of top-down outside-in foliar damage and so the reason for that is it's a it's a lack of water getting to the extremities of the tree so if you don't know how true um, water travels through trees it's it's something called cohesion tension uh, where basically water molecules are slightly negatively charged and so they're kind of attracted to each other and as trees photosynthesize and they evapotranspirate, meaning they put water into the atmosphere, um, a water molecule gets pulled out into the atmosphere from the leaf. And then this chain of water molecules moves up. So that cohesion tension just keeps this change, chain of water moving up the tree and out into the branches. In severe drought conditions, that chain gets broken. And wherever that chain breaks, you start to see foliar damage. So here, for instance, the, that chain got broke somewhere down here, and all of this stuff died off. Um, so now, this does not necessarily mean that this tree is going to die. It's certainly not good for the tree. Um, but if we have good conditions going forward, one of these branches here will become the new leader. And that's how you get those weird curvy trees. Um, and so, it's not, you know, this tree's not necessarily a goner, but given the fact that we are expected to have more severe droughts in the future, um, it is something that we have to start thinking about because drought stress is cumulative. So if this tree has one bad year, it's not enough to just have like our usual wet winter and then it's kind of recessed at the clock and it's good to go to next year. Um, you know, if, if it gets another drop the next year, it's going to get hit twice as hard, basically. Uh, it's kind of like getting kicked while it's down. So we saw a lot of damage. I'm sure a lot of you saw it. You know, you can drive down I-5 and you can see damage like this. Um, it is common, but I don't, I wouldn't characterize it as widespread. And one of the reasons for this is that a lot of this damage we're seeing occurs in, in areas that are already under significant water stress. So trees along forest edges, uh, trees in yards or pastures near roads and developed areas. So these are stressful areas for trees to already exist. So look at this one. This tree is in an open pasture. It is surrounded by grass, which is very competitive for water. And one of the reasons for this is that, you know, one of the reasons we don't see widespread drought damage in the interior forests is that they benefit from a forest canopy that is actually a little bit better at keeping moisture in the soil. Uh, you're not really losing it like you would out, you know, out in the open. This guy's out on his own and he doesn't benefit from that forest canopy. Um, and a lot of that is a function too, not just of a lack of water, but the heat. So that's also part of what's unusual about some of the droughts that we've seen is that 
it's not just a lack of water. You know, we're used to not having any water between the end of June, and September around here. Um, but the heat, um, 2018 was really hot, for example, hotter than usual. And so that really accelerates that moisture loss, and that can really damage trees. Trees aren't really used to that necessarily. So the, the hot, dry summers are really what we want to avoid in the future if we can. I know it's not up to us. Um, so the other part here too is certain soil types are more susceptible. So shallow soils, um, and this is a little counterintuitive because a lot of those shallow soils are wetlands. Um, they have kind of like a high water table uh, or a high restrictive layer that a lot makes water kind of pool. And so people will find that these areas are actually struggling from drought and it's, it's counterintuitive, right? Because it's a wet area. But those areas are drying out earlier uh, than usual in the summer and those trees have shallow root systems. So they do not have uh, the proper resilience to respond to a challenge like this. And that's where you really see a lot of damage, particularly in cedar. I've seen a lot of damage in cedar in those shallow soils. And then excessively dry soils, and that's pretty intuitive. Like really gravelly soils that are already on the edge of being habitable by trees. Uh, it's, you know, those trees are gonna really struggle too. Okay, um, so one example of this is big leaf maple decline. Um, some of you may have seen this. And it's also an example of a, an inability on, uh, uh, foresters part, scientists part, to actually properly identify a forest health issue. So not everything has been identified yet. And that's important lesson to learn. Um, big leaf maple decline. So a little trick of the trade here, if you hear the word decline, it just means things are dying and we don't know why. Uh, maybe I shouldn't give this secret away, I don't know. Um, but big leaf maple decline is just kind of uh, characterizing this widespread um, dieback that we're seeing in big leaf maples. And they've been looking at it for close to 10 years now, I think, and they haven't been able to isolate it down to a single you know, culprit. Uh, there was a virus they thought maybe, there was a leaf hopper, um, and it just hasn't been across the board consistent. And so really what they're boiling down to now at this point is they think this is just a function of the drought that we're seeing because a lot of the trees that they see um, dying from this are in those areas that are really stressed, you know, grassy areas, yards, forest edges, that kind of thing. Uh, so when you hear big leaf maple decline, that's what people are referring to. Right, I'm running a little bit behind, so I'm going to try to speed up a little bit. Um, when we talk about forest health concerns, this maybe is the most common uh, invasive plants. And they're everywhere. I'm sure we all recognize all of these here, um, but they can cause serious problems for forest health. That picture I showed earlier where the trees or the forest was just blanketed in English ivy. Um, the long-term prospect of having a forest there is, is small if you don't do anything, because the ivy can overtop the trees and kill them, and also no trees are gonna be able to get established in the understory there. So these things really do need to be addressed. Um, the shade intolerant ones, uh, like Himalayan blackberry, scotch broom, reed canary grass, those are more short-term problems. Because they're shade intolerant, if you get a forest over top of them, they tend to go away. Um, so that, it's really about managing them in the short term and allowing your trees to get over top of them and, and outcompete these very nasty invasive species, invasive weeds. Um, and then for the most part, as soon as you cut those trees down, they're gonna come right back. The Scotch broom, I think it's seed viability in the ground is like 50 to 60 years or something like that. So it's gonna come back as soon as you cut those trees down, but at least in the, in the meantime, because they're so shade intolerant, they won't get established underneath. Now your shade tolerant um, invasive weeds like English ivy and English holly, those are gonna be able to establish whether there's forest there or not. And that's why they really take uh, long-term management, monitoring and removal. Um, and so, you know, for you guys, nobody's gonna come into your, your master gardener clinic and say, you know, my tree's sick and you're gonna be able to identify it as an English ivy problem. That's not really how it works. It's a forest problem. Um, so it may not be very relevant. 
but it is important to know nonetheless when you spot it because the English IV, for instance, when it gets into that carpet mode, uh, it is just so, so much work to get rid of that and restore that. So getting it early um, and, and making sure that it doesn't get established is uh, really important. And if you are able to spread that message at all, um, that's really the way to do it is again, prevention over a cure. Uh, moving on though, uh, this will be of some importance to you all, I'm sure. Um, there are invasive species of fungus and disease, or fungus and insects on the horizon that can be, um, you know, a little bit terrifying. These are maybe the ones that keep me up at night more than the bark beetle and the creek pot. So, you know, these are things like gypsy moth, sudden oak death, uh, emerald ash borer, I'm sure you've all heard of. I'm from Michigan. I grew up about half an hour from where emerald ash borer got started in Garden City. Um, it was brought over in a shipping crate from China. It got established, I think, a little bit, like 98. I think they, they, they think it got established as early as 98. Um, by 2010 or so, it was difficult to find an ash tree in the lower peninsula of Michigan. You know, it was that fast. So that, you know, these are examples of invasive species that can truly decimate an entire genus. I mean, so they're finding now with studies that about 1% of the ash trees um, in the Eastern forests are resistant to this emerald ash borer. So they are gonna come back, but it's gonna take a long, long time for that to happen. And so prevention here again is really important, being able to spot these things when they get established and quarantine them and manage them before it spreads uh, is really the only way to do this. And so this is emerald ash borer here on the right. We do have an ash species here in Washington, Oregon ash. Um, we only have one. So the damage probably wouldn't be nearly as widespread as it was uh, back east, where there's a lot of different species of ash. But it will still be very damaging because our ash is kind of a niche species. It, it um, inhabits a wetlands. It's a, it's a tree that basically will grow in wet areas where no other tree will grow. So if we lose that species, it will be ecologically uh, disastrous. And so it's really important to keep your eye out for these kind of things. I do not have any problem with people sending me pictures. Uh, I would rather they did than they didn't. And there's also a lot of other resources with like um, WSDA and uh, APHIS, which is the federal uh, organization responsible for invasive species management, that kind of thing. So just for an example, we have white pine blister rust in Southwest Washington. And some of you may not know this, um, this is a fungus that got established in the early 1900s and basically decimated the, the Western white pine populations around here. It's very, it used to be a much bigger component of our forests and uh, now you really don't see it very often. So that's just an example of, of an invasive species that has done some serious damage here and why being aware of the threats is super important. Okay, and I think this is the last bit here. Uh, I wanted to talk about overstocking. I've alluded to it before. Um, in terms of forest health issues, I think this may be the most prevalent one. Oh, looks like we got a question about uh, ash, emerald ash borer. So the symptoms really, you know, this isn't, it's difficult. Um, I mean, obviously if you saw one of these guys, that would be the first. The thing is by the, a lot of times by the time you, you know you have it, um, it's already pretty well established. So the first thing that you would notice is some dieback in the branches. Um, so in the crown, you would start to see the crown receding, different um, branches dying off, and then eventually the entire tree dying. Now you can, catch it earlier by looking at the trunk. And what you'll see is these D-shaped exit holes. And if you look up an old ash borer exit hole, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. It's like a perfect D-shape. And um, that is where the adult either entered or left the tree. 
And so that would be a way to catch it um, relatively early. And I'm not saying you should go out there with a magnifying glass and check every inch of all your trees, um, but just something to keep an eye out for. Right now, Emerald Ash Borer is as far west as Colorado. Um, and it, I guess, is having a hard time getting over the mountains, which is good. But all it takes is for someone to bring it over on some firewood. Um, that's why I am a huge proponent of buying local firewood. Do not move firewood more than you know five miles is a rule of thumb. And we need to start doing that now. Um, but that's, that's one of the best ways you can prevent any sort of invasive species is not moving firewood very far. Uh, or any kind of plant material, really. But I hope that answers your question. I know it's it's kind of vague, but uh, there, it's difficult to spot early, for sure. All right, so overstocking, um, it's it's that process where you know there's just too many trees, not enough space. Um, the reason that this becomes an issue is because you know a lot of people either bought land that was planted by warehouser or something like a warehouse or 20. And, um, you know, it was planted at 400 trees per acre and all those trees, most of them survived. Um, but they're not really thinning themselves out very well. And the reason for that is we plant things, we tend to do it, uh, plant things equidistant, right? So at the same spacing at the same time from the same genetic stock, all of the same species usually. Uh, these are the situations we're coming into. So it's kind of like, I've heard it compared to putting 100 Mike Tysons in a boxing ring, and none of them can really outdo the others. And so what we reach is this state of stand stagnation, where the trees are, are just gonna keep growing taller and taller, but they're not able to put on much diameter growth. And so you get these really small height to diameter ratios, these skinny little whip-like trees, and those trees become codependent on each other. Um, so that if you go in and you thin, and what we would say is you've missed your thinning window at this point, because the trees are dependent on each other. And you go in and you thin now, all the rest will get blown over by the wind. So that's why hitting that thinning window is so, so important. And I can't tell you how many times I go to a landowner and they just have completely missed their thinning window. And it's really not their fault because no one told them that they had to do that. And why would they know? It's not necessarily instinctual. Um, and so there's an, at that point, there's very, there's not a lot you can do. It gets very difficult. Uh, but uh, it, avoiding it is the, is the best thing you can do. Not only just to keep timber growing, but also because trees in this circumstance, like in this picture, are not happy. Uh, you know, looking at this picture back here, when these, they're all not happy. Um, what you want is to have a lot of happy trees. And those are the trees that are going to be able to defend themselves. You know, if we did for whatever reason have a really, really like several hot, dry summers and then some bark beetle populations built up, this would be a forest that might be very susceptible to that problem because those trees cannot defend themselves. Same thing with root rot. Trees can defend themselves from root rot too, but not if they don't have the proper resources. So you tell, I, I mentioned the height to di diameter ratios, you know, you can do the math on that, but really what it comes down to is like that tree is 70 foot tall and this tree is 60 foot tall, right? Um, so most of the time you can just kind of see that it's not, uh, the height to diameter ratio is off. Um, live crown ratio is another, uh, oh, we got a question here. I'll answer that in just a second here. So the live crown ratio is the portion of the total stem length that has a living crown on it. And so generally speaking, we want a live crown ratio of about 35 to 60%, uh, at least for timber growing. And when you get down to these really small crowns, what happens is um, it no longer has a photosynthetic engine that's strong enough to responds to the resources that you give it when you do thin. So from a timber perspective, this is really bad. You know, you're going to thin and then this tree is going to have to grow for a few years to put on more crown before it can actually respond to those new resources you're giving it. So the other sign here, and this is the easiest one, is if you look under here, there's nothing growing underneath. 
So all these trees are competing for every little drop of light that they can get, and there's nothing available on the understory. So that is an indicator of um, a forest being overstocked. So back to the thinning window question. A, a thinning window, uh, it really refers to timber management, but again, it has applications to forest health as well. Um, a thinning window starts in a forest lifespan when the trees are getting to a point where you have crown closure and um, they're sort of starting to fill in all the gaps, you know, compared to when they were just little seedlings. Um, so you want to start to thin about that time. So one of the questions I, I should backtrack, one of the questions I get all the time is, okay, so we plant at 400 trees per acre, but we aim for about 200 trees per acre at 40 to 50 years old. Why don't we just plant 200 trees per acre to begin with? The reason for that is that you need all those trees. You need that stand density early on to force those trees to put on vertical growth. Otherwise, they'll kind of just grow bushy. They won't put on high growth if they don't need to. So that's why we uh, plant more densely. And so you wanna, your thinning window becomes a period where you're still getting that pressure to grow vertically, but you're not gone so far that the crowns have receded. So this is actually a pretty accurate description of your thinning window is when your live crown ratios are between about 60 and 30%, although I would really say 40% here on that top part. So you're getting in there while the trees are still growing. And again, if you miss that, um, it, you, you're losing out on time and your trees are stressed. And uh, it's really just not, not good for anything. One of the things I say about a forest like this is it's really not doing much for anyone in terms of ecosystem services, right? It's barely putting on any timber value. Um, and it is also not serving a wildlife function. There is no diversity here. Um, so it's, it's not great, generally speaking. So what would you do is a very good question. Um, so in this situation, I remember this landowner, um, he was particularly active. What I told him he could try doing is, is doing very, very light thinning spread out over time. So like in a given year, take out about 10% of the stems. Um, and then the next year, take another 10% and just kind of keep thinning. And what you're doing here is you're selecting, you're, you're selecting trees to keep at this point. You're, you want to keep all the trees that have, you know, somehow managed to have good diameter and a good crown ratio. Um, so that, you know, those, those are the ones that are actually going to do quite well in the future. So that's what I suggested in this scenario. Um, sometimes I tell people just leave it. Um, because if you thin at this point, you're going to lose all your trees. And, you know, over time, these, this forest will thin itself out, but it could take another two decades at this point. You know, it is, uh, it's unfortunate, but that might be the only option they have is to just let it go. Um, or alternatively, you could cut it all down, sell it for what it's worth and start over. Not a lot of people want to do that though. All right, so uh, in this neck of the woods or down in Clark County, um, so I should mention here, this is a forest health uh, website that the DNR has. It's like an interactive map, really cool. So the forest health uh, division there, they do flyovers on a plane of all the forested areas in Washington. And these guys are just so good at spotting, you know, disease, insects, air damage and all that stuff that they can do it from the plane and then they'll note that on like a GIS iPad function whatever and they'll go and ground truth some of it to make sure that they're you know doing it right and then they map all of this and they do it every year so this is available on that uh, link here pretty cool I just took this screenshot so all of this pink stuff um, this is just over the Skamania County line this is all uh, bark beetle or some sort of beetle damage and um, this blue stuff is all bear damage, uh, which is really interesting. So, and one thing you'll see, especially you guys are down Clark County, you're near the gorge, as you go further east, you get more into the intermountain 
forest type where beetles do become a little bit more of an issue. Um, and it just, the forest ecology is a little bit different. But here in Clark County, you're pretty solidly outside of that. Um, and as you can see, bear tends to be, as you, if you get on this map and you look around, bear really tends to be the biggest uh, factor. Uh, I'm, because I'm so far over, I'm going to skip over the fire part. Um, again, that's more for some of the landowners in the, uh, that I usually work with. But if you have any questions about that, feel free to reach out. Um, just to quickly recap, um, you know, a forest is considered healthy when it is resilient and vigorous in providing a suite of ecosystem services. So this is again why active management is really key. You don't just wait until something happens. You get in there early and you make sure your trees are healthy and happy. Um, but that said, tree mortality is often natural and beneficial. Having a few trees die in your forest can add a lot to to it, you know, in terms of wildlife habitat, um, soil function, that kind of stuff. Resilience is rooted in diversity. So having lots of different species uh, in there and different structures, um, you know, it's, it's what's going to help your forest thrive in the long term, especially since we're dealing with really unprecedented threats to forest health at this time. Uh, active management is key, kind of covered that already. Insects are rarely the primary cause of death here in Western Washington. Um, for some reason, uh, I kind of mentioned earlier, there does seem to be a lot of fear around insects and trees, but um, really, I mean, if you're having trees that are dying, fungus is usually probably uh, the culprit, more commonly at least. Products are almost never the answer. You may even get people knocking on your door telling you something's wrong with your tree and that such and such product is going to take care of it. I would hesitate to engage on those, get another opinion. I'm not saying that they're completely wrong. Um, you know, my brother is an arborist, so I don't have anything against arborists, but there are some people out there that are kind of trying to sell you snake oil. And in a forest setting, products are almost never the answer. Like, hardly ever the answer, just because they're not financially feasible, for one. But also, they're not that effective all the time on a wide scale. And you have resources at your disposal. Usually this is the point where I would go into all the different assistance resources available to landowners. But for now, I think you should just consider me uh, a resource. Um, here's some of my information, uh, my email, phone, my office phone. But I am checking messages right now, oops. Um, so I have a website, I have a Facebook, I also have an email listserv for some of my events. I, you know, I send out announcements and that kind of thing. And then this is an online newsletter. Um, all of that stuff you can find on my website there if you're interested. But I've gone 15 minutes over. So uh, yeah, if anybody's got any questions, I don't know, Erica, if, how much time you got, but, um, or if there are any questions. But uh, that is all I have for today. So um, maybe we have time for just one or two quick questions. If someone wants to type in the chat box. Thank you. I'm glad that was, uh, glad it was informative. And like I said, you know, people may not retain all of this stuff. I'm sure it's a lot, um, but consider me a resource. And also I'm recording this. Um, Erica, I don't know if we discussed making that available or not. Yeah, so if you could send me the link, that would be great. Um, I'd mm -hmm. like available, and then um, I can send that to folks. Okay, yeah, we'll do that. Okay, well, um, is there a way to stop recording at this point? And also to, um, did you turn the uh, meeting over to me? Um, not yet. I